Whether you call it a New England IPA, NEPA, or Hazy, this cloudy IPA has never been more popular. So it's only natural that the home brewer would like to try their hand at brewing one. But it turns out it's a style that has a lot of specifics and potential issues that can be troublesome for a new brewer. So today I have a list of things that you can do to brew your best Hazy right out of the gate. I'm Trent Musho and this is The Brew Show. Let's make the best Hazy IPA possible. Almost every brewery these days has some version of a New England IPA, and not all are created equal. I've had plenty of ones that do not sit well in my taste buds, and at times have honestly made me avoid hazies at all costs. But at some point you probably tried one and been really surprised about how good it can be. Bursting with tropical aromas and flavors, a subdued bitterness, a fluffy mouthfeel, and a distinct hazy golden glow. But how does one replicate a great version at the home brewery? You probably heard a lot of things you can do to make a good hazy IPA. Add a bunch of calcium chloride to the water, add a bunch of flaked adjuncts to the mash, and add a buttload of hops. And while to some degree that is true, there's a bit more refinement to the style than one would expect, and it can easily be overdone. On top of that, any IPAs are highly susceptible to oxidation, which for new brewers can be tough to grasp. So what I decided to do was put together a foolproof plan, from brew day to that first pour, to ensure your next hazy IPA is a hero and not a zero. Let's jump in and talk about the recipe and how to get started on the right foot. Like many styles, there's some wiggle room here for interpretation, and you should feel free to explore and experiment to get a recipe that tastes good to you. But generally, you need to use the grain bill to develop the look and mouthfeel of your beer, and that's usually done through flaked adjuncts like oats, flaked wheat, or flaked barley. The way that these differ from normal malts is the fact that they're not actually malted. They're instead pre-gelatinized, which is a way to make the starches readily available for the mash. This process means the adjuncts have a higher protein content, and in turn gives the beer a fuller body as well as add to the cloudiness in your beer, often referred to as a protein haze. So with that in mind, having a large percentage of your grain bill with flaked adjuncts is a good idea, but they don't give as much fermentable sugars, so finding a balance is key. I found that 20 to 30% of your total grain bill is a good sweet spot, and that can be a mix of the flaked adjuncts. It's up to you to find what you like best. Malted wheat is also a good option here, because it's also high in proteins that can aid in the look and body of your beer. So try subbing that in to the 25 to 30%. I find it adds a bit more crispness to the finish and will also add more fermentable sugars than its flaked brother. Keep in mind the higher proteins also come with a thicker mash. If you brew in a bag, it's no big deal. But for other systems that recirculate the wort, you may need to add rice hulls to keep your mash from getting stuck. The rest of your grain bill should be pretty simple. Pale malt or pilsen malt is fine. I like adding a bit of pale malt like Maris Otter for some more malty character and the slightly more golden color it adds. Water is the second crucial part to the brew day and should not be overlooked. Having control over the mineral content, especially the chloride to sulfate ratio, can make or break the way your any IPA tastes and how its apparent bitterness can be perceived. If you're not familiar with water chemistry in beer, I have a video to help you out, so definitely check that out. I promise it'll improve all your beers. But to quickly cover it here, there are a bunch of minerals that make up water, but only a few that impact our beer. Two of the most popular, especially when talking about IPAs, are sulfate and chloride. The ratio between these two can impact how bitter your beer can seem. A higher sulfate level will lead to a sharper and more pronounced bitterness, whereas a higher chloride level will lead to a more rounded and softer bitterness which is what we're looking for in hazy. A good rule of thumb is two to one chloride to sulfate level in your water. That means twice as much chloride. The best way to achieve this is start with a blank slate of water, like distilled or RO, and then add in your own brewing salts to hit the target. There's a bunch of water profiles for New England IPAs online, but if you stick around to the end, I'll share a sample recipe and water profile so you can try and replicate it at home. Okay, with those ingredients together, let's start mashing. A mash temperature around 154 degrees Fahrenheit is a great place to be. It'll leave you with slightly less fermentable sugars, which means some sweetness, but not too much in the finished beer, which will blend nicely with the hops we'll be adding. Speaking of which, okay, this is where a lot of creativity can come in, and you can go many ways with this. There are so many hops out there for you to choose from, but the best for a hazy are ones that give stone fruit, citrus, and tropical aromas and flavors. USAHops.org has a hop finder that's an awesome tool for finding hops by their flavor profile. It's not a complete list of every hop, but it can certainly get you in the right zone. Also finding or brewing a smash beer with these hops can help you find the ones you really love. While a normal IPA is focused on bitterness, 
Here we're really focusing on the aroma hops, but that doesn't mean we won't need bitterness to balance out the sweet wort. I found that hitting around 50 IBUs is a good goal, and you can really use a small amount of a bittering hop to hit that quickly. By using a neutral bittering hop like Magnum or Warrior at the start of your boil, you can actually shorten the overall boil time to something like 30 minutes, because the rest of your flavor hops will be added at the end of the boil. And that's key. You don't want to add all those flavor hops too early in the boil, or else you'll lose all those delicate hop oils and aromas that make this style unique. When exactly you add them can depend on your preference, but I found that a simple Whirlpool addition is all I ever need. Whirlpooling, or adding hops after the boil but before chilling, allows you to keep those aromas intact, and you won't extract too much bitterness. I usually Whirlpool around 175 degrees Fahrenheit and steep the hops for about 15 minutes before chilling down. Since you don't get a ton of bitterness from this, that means you can add a good amount here, but you have to be careful, as there's always a point of no return, where your beer can have too much hops. This can sometimes come through as a hop burn or just a general harshness. I prefer to go for about four ounces in my Whirlpool for a five gallon batch, but experiment and see what you prefer. Alternatively, or additionally, you could always go for a dry hop addition, where you add the hops during fermentation for a hop biotransformation, which is basically a fancy way of saying the yeast fermentation and added hops react together, unlocking new flavor compounds and adding to the haze. It's said to add a bright and prominent hop character to your IPA, but in my experience, it's not always necessary. You will get plenty of hop character in the Whirlpool. Plus, dry hopping can be a risk for oxidation, which we'll talk about in a minute. If you're curious more about the dense subject that is hop oils and biotransformation, I'll leave a blog post in the description from Scott Janish, who literally wrote the book on the topic. Yeast choice isn't as vital as some of the past subjects, but there are some things to consider. For one is the flocculation rate of the yeast strain, or how much does the yeast form together and fall to the bottom of the fermenter. A high flocculating yeast means it'll clear up, which is not what we want. So look for a low flocculating yeast. A safe bet is to go for a hazy IPA strain. There's a bunch out there. Kvike can also be a good option here if you don't have a way to control fermentation temperature. So that covers the main ingredients. With those key items in place, you should have everything to create the base for a perfect hazy IPA. But the job's not done yet and you would hate to fall short of the finish line after all that hard work. So let's talk about the NEIPA killer, oxygen. <laughs> yeast needs oxygen to do their job, but once fermentation is underway, and especially once fermentation is complete, oxygen is public enemy number one. Exposing oxygen to your beer at this stage will lead to your beer changing color from a beautiful gold to a dirty purple brown. But worst of all, it has major damaging effects to the flavor and aroma of your beer. Not only will oxidation give you a stale flavor to your beer, that's sometimes described as wet cardboard, but the hop characteristics will greatly diminish and change. That's why I generally avoid dry hopping unless I know it's an oxygen-free zone. It's just too risky. Adding dry hops at high krausen or high fermentation activity is a safer bet, as the yeast could still be taking in oxygen. But with a style like this that's so sensitive, I find it better to never open the fermenter. But dry hopping is not the only risk point. Transferring into kegs is also a place to take care. Firstly, I never cold crash a hazy. Cooling beer down will create negative pressure. That chilling process creates suck back. If you've ever put your fermenter in a fridge and came back to find your airlock was empty, that's suck back. Along with the star sand is coming a bunch of oxygen into your fermenter. No bueno. Okay, so no cold crash, but what about transferring into the keg? Normally, opening up the keg lid and racking in from your spigot is no biggie on other styles. But all that oxygen rushing in with the beer is not going to be good for hazies. Also, back at the top of your fermenter, you'll be sucking in oxygen from the bung hole. You know, the little hole at the top of your fermenter. So the answer to all of this is a closed transfer. A closed transfer is where the beer exits the fermenter and goes directly into a purged keg without touching the air. And additionally, there is CO2 being applied to the top of the fermenter, so no oxygen gets sucked in. The easiest way to do this is to use a liquid connect and some tubing to go from the fermenter into the liquid line, carefully transferring the beer down the dip tube for minimal disturbance. It's key that your keg is purged of oxygen first, whether by filling it completely with sanitizer and then pushing it out, or just filling it with CO2 and relieving the pressure several times until you feel it's safe. Then the last step is adding CO2 to the top of your fermenter, creating zero ways for oxygen to touch your beer. A great way to do that is to use one of these carbonation caps, like I showed in my favorite tools video. By adding a small piece of tubing and then sliding it through a bung, you can create a nice seal on your fermenter. And if you don't have a pressurized fermenter, and you have something like a plastic bucket, 
or even this anvil bucket that can't hold pressure, just dial back the CO2 to something like 1 PSI, giving it just the smallest amount of CO2 that'll keep you in an oxygen-free environment but won't blow the top off. If anything, the bung will fly out first. Then all you need to do is open the PRV in your keg to let out any last bit of pressure, open your fermenter spigot, and turn on the CO2 to let it flow through. Close up the keg and apply your pressure, pulling the PRV a few times to be extra, extra sure. And then you should be set to enjoy the best New England IPA in town. Some other things to consider. It probably goes without saying, but don't use any clarifying agents like Irish Moss or Whirlflock. I only say this because I've definitely added a Whirlflock before out of habit. It might still turn out hazy, but try to work with the beer, not against it. The use of preservatives can do wonders to keep your hazy tasting fresh for longer. Sulfites like potassium metabisulfite, aka Camden tablet, or ascorbic acid can be added to the keg and will act as antioxidants, scrubbing any oxygen that could be hanging around. Definitely worth giving a try if you plan to keep it on tap for a while. Although, the best hazies are always the fresh ones, so you should be enjoying this ASAP. If you're planning to bottle, I'll say it can be done, although it's much riskier than kegging. Some key things to do is to pre-portion out your priming sugar into each bottle first. Don't use a bottling bucket. Then use a bottling wand connected to your spigot like so to minimize oxygen as much as possible. It'll close the beer off in between bottles for you, so you're not struggling when filling up. And if you have any access to CO2, try to purge the bottles first to minimize the oxygen that's in them. Although secondary fermentation will likely consume most of that oxygen to create pressure anyway but best to reduce oxidation contamination as much as possible. Now I'll quickly share a recipe if you're looking for a specific example. Start with seven gallons of distilled water and add gypsum, epsom salt, baking soda, and calcium chloride to hit a water profile that looks like this. Note the two to one chloride to sulfate levels. The grain bill I'm using is 40% Maris Otter, 30% Pilsner, 20% malted wheat, and 10% flaked oats. Mash at 154 for 45 minutes. Then bring to a boil. At the top of the 30 minute boil, add one ounce of Warrior for roughly 47 IBUs. Then at the end of the boil, chill down to 175 and add two ounces each of Motueka and Simcoe for a 15 minute Whirlpool addition. You can totally use your favorite flavoring hops here. Lastly, chill down to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideally your OG should be around 1.065 and pitch White Labs WLP067 Coastal Haze Yeast. Ferment for one week. Close transfer into a keg and serve as soon as it's to pressure. Enjoy. So like I said, it may seem simple on the outside, but there's a lot more that goes into making the perfect New England IPA than you might think. But hopefully you now have all the tools to get brewing your own awesome version. I'm sure some of you have some different ways to make hazies, and I'd love to hear from you. Let me know down below your tips for creating the perfect fruit bomb of an IPA. I hope you got something out of this video. And if you do brew a hazy, I'd love to hear from you. Send me some pics on Instagram. Or head over to the Discord and share some pics of your successes. Or even your mistakes. There's a great community over there with some really smart brewers that can help you out. Thanks so much for watching. Happy brewing and cheers. Cheers.